yeah, we're starting. We can talk about this. Um, you're in the business of transformation. Your job is to transform your client from where they are today to where, where they want to be tomorrow. Not only do you have to sell them on that future, but you have to be able to provide it. Oh, I can't do these things you're asking me is a statement you should probably say if you can't if you can't do that. And we got everyone well, joining. Like a look into what we discussed in the green room. We just go <laughs> back and forth. We got done discussing cigars with Jimmy uh, and immediately went into sales culture. You know, somebody has to sell a cigar. It's all, it's all connected, man. The world comes full circle. Yeah. Uh, and the chat should be open. If somebody wants to test that in the audience right now for us, that would be wonderful. Testing, testing, testing. testing. Thank you. Oh, I see Glenn's here. Sweet. We'll get started uh, in a few minutes. We'll let everyone trickle in. Uh, and the Q&A, I imagine we'll get a ton of questions as well about what do we do in this specific situation? Stuff like that. Yeah, you're going to get questions like, when's Connor going to get old enough to grow a beard? I got like four chin hairs growing right here. I went to sleep uh, with four chin hairs one night and woke up with this. So it, it happens fast, faster than you think. Faster than I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, and you're both, uh, you both have red beards too. And if I could grow a single facial hair, I guarantee I would too. I've, yeah, I've got you. a little gray coming in here, but it hides well in the low light. So I keep the lights dim in here. <laughs> keep the lights dim. I keep the, uh, the spirit of the Lord over here. This is, this is the seasoning that shows the seasoned salesman right here. That's the salt and pepper from the seasoned salesman. Seasoned salesman. We got people from Norway. And Belgium. Those are my people. That's great. We're global. Global, baby. We're global. Finn worldwide. Wide. Worldwide. Puerto Rico. All right, Glenn, I'm old, but I, oh. I'm going to say seasoned. Delaware. <laughs> Not just incorporated there. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been incorporated there several times and I lived there for a few years. Yes, yes, yes. For those of you who just joined, <clears throat> we're waiting a few minutes. We got South Africa. We really do have people everywhere. If somebody's from Antarctica, I think we're close to having all continents. Yeah, they better, they're on Starlink. <laughs> they're on Starlink. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Frontier's running fiber down there. There's like a like they do like the Steam map, global players map, and there's like one guy in Antarctica who logs in. And you just see like one little light, one little blip. Uh, yeah. One little blip. I think it even shows like popular games by location. And it's just like whatever that guy's playing. That's pretty good. All right. Should we kick this thing off, guys? I think we're ready to get started. How about, how about you, Alex? You ready? Let's rock and roll. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about selling cybersecurity solutions. Uh, sales is something that... A lot of people struggle with, a lot of people find it hard to understand, including myself at a lot of times. Uh, the MSP industry is no exception to that. And I've talked with hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of MSPs over the last few years. And I've watched Jimmy talk to MSPs about sales. I've watched Alex talk to MSPs about sales. Uh, and so today is all about y'all, uh, giving you some insights into how should you be thinking about sales differently, how you, how you should be conducting yourself, your business to uh, essentially help your clients understand whether or not you're the right fit for them uh, and how you can help them transform their business. So uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Alex, Alex, introduce yourself. Uh, who are you? Why should people listen? No, I'm Alex Farling. I am currently serving as uh, one of the co-founders over here at Empath, uh, working with Wes Spencer on a huge education initiative for MSPs. So this is one of the things that we'll talk about, sales and sales process. But uh, my history is much the same as a lot of the guys here. I started off as a, as a guy who didn't want to work for anybody else. So I ran an MSP for 16 and a half years. Um, in the process, we figured out that account management was kind of broken in the space. And we built a product to help QBRs and account management process that kind of grew into BCIO and customer success tracking. Uh, we sold that product in January to ScalePad, and it is under their watchful eye and continuing to be to be grown over there. So um, I've done a little bit of everything in the space, but uh, but super excited now to be working with Wes over at Empath. Awesome. What is Empath? Can you give us a few more details on that? 
Yeah, um, we're, we're building an education community around what it started out around cybersecurity, and it's really going to expand into um, the entire MSP journey. So we'll be teaching everything from finance and back office accounting to sales process and how to speak cybersecurity to your customer. Awesome. Speaking cybersecurity is uh, might as well be a forgotten language at this point. It's a challenge, right? And it's uh, the problem is we know too much about it, and we don't know how to dumb it down to our customers. So, um, you know, as we as we bring everybody up through Empath, the goal is just to continually upskill the new employees that come into the space and remind the folks who have been here a long time um, that it doesn't have to be as complicated as we like to make it. Sales can be easy. You just have to make it that way. That's exciting. You've been up to a lot, man. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't sleep a lot. <laughs> uh, he used to have many, many more Lego Star Wars behind him, so that was example of him not. They're sleeping. all in moving boxes. They're still here. Yeah. They're still here. I know they're just not back. Yeah, all I was up. that too. Been super busy. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, uh, Jimmy. Why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you? What are you doing? What did you do? Anything you'd like to cover? Sure, sure. My name is Jimmy Hatzel. I'm the Vice President of Revenue at CyberQP. Uh, I have a background in IT, in sales, in marketing, and in cybersecurity. I uh, had a degree in cybersecurity, um, and I worked in IT for a while, and then I wanted to move over to a cyber company, and I started working at this company called Scout Cybersecurity. It was called Scout Secure Intelligence at the time, and the CEO said to me, I want you to join the company, but I don't want you to work in the security operations center like you think you want to work. I want you to come join the sales team for a couple months, learn how to sell, and then we'll figure out where to put you. And I said, okay. And I sold mid-market SOC and SIM services in 2018, or sold SOC and SIM services in 2018 to mid-market companies when nobody knew what the hell it was. And it was extremely difficult and aggravating, and I learned a ton and um, then I started working with MSPs and we switched the entire business model um, to sell through MSPs. And I uh, helped develop a program there where we would actually work with MSPs, help them generate demand with their clients um, through partner marketing. And then we'd actually help them close the uh, deals with their partners through uh, a uh, like a a sales process, a well-defined sales process. Um, so I did that. The company was eventually acquired a couple of years later by Barracuda. I was at Barracuda for a bit, helped with the company integration, and then um, moved over to CyberQP to build out their sales and marketing team. So I have a pretty uh, diverse background in marketing, sales, IT, cyber. Um, I scare people sometimes because I get on the uh, call and they think it's just some sales guy, right? And then I get all, you know, answer their questions, get technical, can answer the edge cases and stuff too, um, which is so powerful. And that's why I love working with MSPs and helping them sell because you can do that. Awesome. You have uh, quite a storied past for someone who is almost as young as me. I don't know. <laughs> I do not have any of that experience. I don't know a lot of guys in this space who actually have a degree in cybersecurity. So hats off, my friend. It was one of the first ones. Yep. And um, yeah, now they're a lot more common. But I've learned like... something today. Now it's everybody else's turn. Yeah. Now it's everybody else's turn. Yeah. For those of you who are listening, uh, we love when you get involved. Uh, I find that the most value y'all uh, you'll get out of any conversation like this or any webinar is when you ask questions and the wonderful people such as Alex and Jimmy get to answer them. You know, it can be relevant to your business. It can just be a question in general. It doesn't matter. But getting involved, asking questions, asking us to unpack something that we might skip by. As Alex said, sometimes you forget if you do this long enough how much you've really learned and how much you know and where you started. So um, if if you want us to unpack something a little further, if you want us to dive into a specific question, don't, don't hesitate to ask that either in the chat or in the actual Q&A right here. Uh, my first question is to Alex. Let's. Uh, I was. We were talking about this in the green room, and we were kind of starting about starting on it. Uh, security uh, sales culture at MSPs. Yeah. Uh, what's your first thoughts when you hear sales culture? Well, you know, it can go. It goes one of two ways, right? There's there, there's the external sales culture, which is what is happening between me and my customer, and we should unpack that a little bit. But we should also unpack the little bit of a dichotomy that happens between sales and service delivery inside the MSP. Because yeah. there's always this little divide, whereas the sales guy, I run out and promise things. 
and then someone else has to deliver it, right? So there's always a challenge as, an, as the owner, especially as you start to outgrow owner-led sales of making sure that the salesperson fits in with the team instead of everybody thinking, ah, oh, that guy just golfs for a living. He doesn't do real work. He comes back and promises shit and we have to deliver it for him, right? Um, there, there's always that little bit. But on the on the customer facing side, right? There's there's a couple of different ways that uh, that sales happen, and there is this this pressure, this belief that I have to go in and pound on my customer. We hired an account rep at, at Lifecycle Insights, and he came in. He thought he was going to impress us all, and he's like, "I've been studying sales, and I took this course, and he taught me to always be closing." And I went, "I really liked this kid until he said those words," and <laughs> and I just went. I, and, and we hired him and the first our first conversation was, I don't ever want to hear that again. Let's talk about consultative selling. Let's talk about how we find win-win deals where our customer is looking for to solve a problem and technology actually is the solution to that problem and we can deliver and they win at the same time because that beats a sales culture all day, every day. This consultative selling, um, that kind of, uh, if, if you're into reading books, um, go look up Getting Naked. It's one of the best books out there. Please look for Getting Naked book, uh, not just Getting Naked on Google. You'll get weird stuff, but um, but it's one of the best books. And basically what they talk about is consulting before they're your customer, right? Just go in and treat them like they're your customer. Do some free consultation. And before you know it, they'll be asking you, hey, what does it cost for us to just bring you on and have you help us do this? Um, and, and if we can get out of that pushy sales culture, MSPs almost always win. I think that's the the, the best place to start about it. What's uh, what's evidence that you might have a pushy sales culture? Like a lot of people, whether they willingly or unwillingly turn a blind eye to how they act, <clears throat> how could you recognize it in your own company? Well, I think every one of us can recognize it when one of our vendors calls, right? We've all, we've all answered one of those phone calls. And yeah, if it yeah. starts with, um, hey, have you got a minute so I can tell you about all the cool stuff we've got? Um, that, that's, that's a sales call, right? If it's, Hey, how, how's your, how's everything working out in your business? How's technology supporting your business? What's going on in your world? Is technology in the way of you being profitable, of you being productive, of you continuing to grow in what might be a questionable economy? COVID was a great opportunity to talk about this, right? Everyone's business changed. Yeah. So Mr. Prospect, I'm sure your business is changing, you know, literally under your feet as we're sitting here talking about it. Is, is technology enabling that or, or is it standing in your way? And they'll tell you that. They'll, they'll, they'll give you that answer. That's not a scary answer. So when they give you that answer, it's the opportunity for you to unpack it and help them figure out um, what new technology might help solve for the problems they have, where, where you can enable technology. One of my favorite questions was, are you growing or shrinking in COVID? Because some companies, you know, if you were making face masks, I mean, my God, your, your profits were through the roof. Um, if you were a restaurant, you didn't have any profits and you were just hoping you could stay open. And in some cases, technology could enable folks to, to grow faster. And in other cases, it could help them solve for the fact that unfortunately they had to lay off people and still keep the doors open and still keep business going. So when we get in that consultative mindset of, you know, how do you ring the cash register? What does it look like for money to flow through your business? And how can I break down the technology barriers that, that help that money flow through your business? That's when we win. And it doesn't have to feel like a sales pitch. You heard me say this at Kernan's and you said something to me afterwards. Um, if it sounds gross, just don't say it. Like if you feel like you're having that gross hard close where you're having to go, Connor, will you please sign on the dotted line and do business with me? Maybe you did something wrong. Yeah. Absolutely. A statement that you made that I remember is uh, you're not in the business of selling. You're in the business of transforming. That's where you provide all your value is your, your client comes to you or you approach them and they're at point A. And you're like, well, you want to be at point B. How long do you want it to take to get you there? Uh, and how can I help you do that? And then it's your job to sell the vision of, oh, I'm the thing between point A and B. Or ideally, all of us have worked with clients that we knew we shouldn't have, right? Where we should have just said, hey, Mr. or Mr. Mister or Mrs. Client, uh, don't sound like you're quite a fit for us. Here are some other folks that you should reach out to looking for that opportunity. Uh and a lot of people and, after taking that wish they would have. And wouldn't it be nice if all if every MSP was mature enough and in a great enough place that they could do that? But the reality is they're not. And some of them have to take on customers that are less than perfect. So we have yeah. to get in there and really unpack it with them and figure out, you know, hey, you're here today. What does it look like to get you here? And what is it going to take? Um, you know, you've heard this language from every car salesman you've ever talked to, right? Hey, Jimmy, you're going to look great driving this little red sports car with the top down on a, on a 75 degree afternoon. Right. If you can paint that picture for your customer about technology, hey, life's going to be easier when your users can do an automatic password reset online and they don't have to call into the help desk. They can do it on a Saturday afternoon. 
right? All of a sudden my business owner goes, oh, that sucks less. I like this guy. There's there's also like time to value is an important part of like the uh, gross sales culture. So like the time between when someone realizes it buys something and they realize the value of what they purchase and they see an ROI on it. And the shorter that time, uh, the happier the customer is going to be. And as an MSP, we're in the business of solving problems, right? We're like, you're not just a VAR, right? You're not just pushing product on people, right? We're, we're solving technology needs and, and connecting dots and things like that. Um, so like someone, when they buy something from you, like they should feel good after. And at the end of the day, all you're doing is trying to help people. You're trying to help them grow their business and in doing that, selling them some of the pro- <clears throat> selling them something in the process because it can help them with their business needs, whatever it is, growing, shrinking, managing, whatever it is. Um, so like, it's just important to remember that. And, and like MSP is a relationship business. It's done mostly through referrals, smaller uh, MSPs, or maybe I'm not even small, I don't even want to say small because you can get really big. Like the first five, 10 million in, in ARR for MSPs are almost always done through relationships and through community and uh, owner-led sales, right? There might be a small sales team, but it's the owner feeding the leads and, and people that they know. So your reputation is everything. And people get a bad taste in their mouth from, you know, incessant salespeople or people just trying to get the signature at the dotted line. And like the thing that you need to remember as an MSP is, is I'm here to help people. And if you're drifting away from that or whatever tactics you're doing, aren't helping people and it's just trying to get a number to go change from a five to a six or whatever, then it's not going to work in the long term. But the beauty of that is, and you mentioned owner-led sales, right? If the owner himself can't go out and stand in front of the products that he's selling in this space, then something's wrong because there are a lot of good products and really good solutions that you can be proud to stand in front of, that you can go to your customer and say, Look, I've worked with, and one of my favorite statements when I was at an MSP was, um, you know, I don't have to convince you that this is going to solve your problem. I know it's going to solve your problem because I've worked with 20 other companies your size in your industry and your space. And when I see customers like you with problems like you have, we deploy these kind of solutions and, and, and it takes you from where you are today to kind of where we talked about you wanting to be. Does that sound like a better place for you? And I know it's going to work because I've done it before. And it's a pretty easy sell when I don't have to go to my customer and go, please sign here so that I can, you know, so that I can make my my payment on my little red sports car. Um, but, you know, it, it really is the ability to sit down with a customer and just say, life gets better if we just follow the process. And, and I know we're going to talk about process a little later, but just the same as we talk about sales process, there's a technology process that most of these MSPs can lather, rinse and repeat. They know if they come in with Microsoft 365 and configure it just like this, uh, the customer's going to have a good experience. And if they come in with a line of business app and configure it just like this, the customer's going to have a good experience. This goes all the way back to Gary Pika, you know, geez, circa 15 years ago, going, you know the recipe. If you put it together, you're going to get chocolate cake. And if you put in the wrong ingredients or if you substitute ingredients, you're not going to get chocolate cake. And so that, that's where it, it's so powerful because most MSPs already know the answers. They really do. Yeah. Let's jump into uh, Keith's question there. I know he just asked another one, but I was reading his first one. Uh, I have never understood how is it possible to simply sell a security stack versus a consultative sale where we discuss integration of best practices, cyber hygiene into existing business workflows and outcomes. How does this esteem panel suggest we frame the sales engagement? I'll keep it simple. If you're pushing product, you you're just pushing product. Like you you're know, behind. Like, you're still a var. Compare it to other people. If you're selling a solution and how the things fit together, that's actual value. People are gonna pay you the monthly fee based on that, not on you know Office 365 plus Sentinel One plus blah 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 bundled together with a forty percent markup. A bunch of stuff that, that they can go out on the internet and buy with their own credit card, right? You know, at, at the end of the day, sales is still relationship driven or largely relationship driven, right? We want we want to do business with people we know, like, and trust. And yep. if you can build that rapport with them without having to push products down their throat, they're more likely to want to work with you for a solution. 
but I, to Jim's point, like this is it's about a solution it's about all how all those things come together it's not about the line items you can put on a bill on the uh sales culture side to to answer Keith's question through through that lens i talk with wes about this all the time is we are closer to cybersecurity than any of your clients and they are closer to their problems than you are so the gap between how you how you should be talking with them and how you how you should be selling to them is you understand cybersecurity at a deeper level. They probably understand their problems or they're able to they feel them at a deeper level. And what you have to do is have them communicate them to you properly, and then you communicate, as Jimmy said, not solutions. Uh, uh sorry, not not solutions, not tools. No solutions. We don't sell no solutions. Solu- yeah, we don't sell solutions. We sell problems. Uh, it's um, like Reg Harnish said on the last podcast that we were on together. He's, most vendors in this industry or most most software you sell exists to help you sell more software. It doesn't help you create a better solution for your for your partners and your clients. It helps you sell more software, which well, doesn't get you to the end goal. It's one of the things we've been railing against at Empath. Everybody has come to us and said, why are you doing education? Every vendor has an education program. And the answer was every vendor has an education program that's designed to teach you how to sell more of their widgets and sprockets, not how to run a better business that makes you more profitable, that lets you take better care of your customers and your employees. At the end of the day, sales is about selling and sales in the MSP should be about selling a win-win deal that has good margin for you, good value for your customer, and really lets you grow your business. It's got to be about that. We can't just be pushing numbers. If we're if we're behind and chasing numbers, we're going to sell a bad deal. We're going to sell a deal that doesn't have enough margin that requires too much work for us to get it done. Yep. Uh, Keith asked another question. Most CFO types are more focused on the cost of a security solution will have on a workflow process and productivity over the actual license and product cost. Do you focus on how you can implement your solutions into the workflow of the organization without a production result? That felt like a lot of words. Uh, what yeah, if I could, process, but it's, it's highlight the problem. CFO will have some idea of the problem, but they're not going to understand the whole problem in it's entirely flesh it out pull the string a little bit, help them fully understand it, and then match it to a solution and don't get too in the details. Yeah, Yeah. I think to Jimmy's point, a CFO understands the money side of the business. They probably don't understand intimately, especially as the businesses get larger and larger, what happens on the front lines. And if you do a good job of engagement in the sales process, you're down in the trenches talking to the people who work in the organization, not the guy who runs the calculator at the top, not the bean counter, but the guy who actually experiences the pain. And one of the most powerful things you can do in your sales process is come back to those leaders and repeat to them what you heard. Hey, Mr. Yep. CFO, I talked to 25 people on the front line and they all told me this. Does that resonate with how you understand the situation? And quite often you'll see that person sit back in their chair and go, no, I hadn't heard that. Yep. And now we've opened a can of worms that there's pain there. This guy doesn't even understand, much less, um, you know, he, now he doesn't feel like he's in a position where he understands how to push back on us and tell us that the cost doesn't match. So maybe that in, includes more digging up of the problem, understanding of the problem, and showing our bean counter how solving this problem on the front line can help him in, in uh, you know, generating revenue or streamlining things in the organization or cost savings or whatever it may be. Yep. I, I would always say, when I was talking to the decision maker who said the the this price is too high, I always say, well, this is all the pain that we agree that you're feeling right now. What's the cost of not helping you with that? Or do you, first off, do you believe we can help you with that? If the answer is yes, it's like, what value do you place on that? Uh, and to highlight your point, I think a lot of people on this call, uh, not necessarily skipped past it, but don't understand how important it is. Most decision makers that I've ever talked to have no idea the problems that their people at the front line, as as Alex called, said that the bean counters are actually facing. So I would literally talk to decision makers and MSPs are no different. You'll talk to a decision maker. You'll say, do you have any problems in this area? And they will tell you, absolutely not. We're good. The cost is too high is an amazing statement. What that says is, Connor, I want to work with you, but I need you to, I need you to get me over the edge. Like I'm this close. I I, want to work with you, but there's, there's an issue here. I'm not sold yet on the value. So show me again how this solves my problem. Nobody yeah. says the cost is too high um, and then continues to engage with you unless they're actually interested in doing business with you. Absolutely. We have a great question from Rocky Cole here. I'm somewhat new to selling in the security space. I'm finding that sales cycles are super slow, even when we do close deals. How do you think about increasing the velocity of sales without being pushy? It's very simple. 
sales is two-step process. Show someone and convince them that they have a problem, show them the problem, and then convince them that you're the solution to that problem. They are not convinced that they have a problem. Cybersecurity. Yep. They are not convinced that the problem is big enough for them to spend the money. So it's education, it's discovery. You don't want to go full fear monger, but if somebody says, "Oh, maybe in Q four we can, you know, protect our endpoints," right? What they're saying is, in Q four we can buy this software, and what you need to spin that as, well, why would you wait until like you, without saying it? And we'll get to it in the sales process. I'm sure Alex has something similar to what I've done before. Um, like they need to change their mind from, oh, I'm going to buy this software in Q4 because that's why I'll have room in my budget, I think, to how could I wait to protect my data until Q4? That's a horrible investment from my point because I have PHI, I have customer records, I have brand reputation, I have all these things to protect. So like, it's always back to discovery. It's always back to discovery discovery, discovery, discovery. It's almost never, I need approval or convincing or something else. They're just not. Yeah, you know, to just to expand on that, there's a couple of reasons a sales cycle might be long and some of them are valid and some of them are to Jimmy's point, not valid at all. Uh, the reasons it may be long, I'm in a contract with someone else, right? If you're running up against that, that's that's just commonplace in this industry. It's not like it was in 2008 when I was the only managed service provider in, in Dover, Delaware, and everybody I ran up against was with a break fix provider and we could yank them out on a moment's notice. But if you're running up against that, where it's literally a real problem with the sales cycle, where I can't make a decision because a contract's not over, I can't make a decision because I'm a municipality and I have to do it in this weird little window or whatever, that's okay. But Use a CRM, use your tools right, set yourself a tickler and a reminder to go back and work on that, to touch it once every 45 days in between until it's ready to go, and then move on to the next thing. You know, Make sure that you're not wasting sales cycles on a deal that can't move, but then really identify what the thing is that's sticking your deals and keeping them from moving. Because most often, to Jimmy's point, when I've found this to be the situation, it's because I screwed up something in my sales process, didn't let the customer understand the value of what we're doing, the priority of the thing that they probably should do first. Um, you know, there's a lot of times when maybe they can't take the whole solution, but maybe they can take the thing that puts out the biggest, most immediate fire. And then you work with them to build a budget that helps them figure out what to do next and after that and after that and after that and after that. Because cybersecurity is also something that's never done, right? Very few customers can you walk in the door and go, I need a hundred grand and I need it today. Most of your customers, the conversation looks something more like it didn't get this way overnight. Yeah. And it's not going to get to perfect overnight. So let's talk about what's immediate and what we need right now and what we can roll in over the next six, 12, 18 months. Yeah. Uh, Rocky, I'll give you a book recommendation. It's called uh, Demand, Side Sa Demand Side Sales 101. It's uh, there's this thing called a jobs to be done framework. And it's basically if you change your sales process from uh, answering questions to your prospects, the people that you will end up doing business with are asking themselves questions, right? And whoever or whatever can give them the answer is how they're going to decide how to purchase. So you have to decide what kind of uh, what kind of services do you provide? What kind of solutions do you provide? Uh, and then what I do is I say, what questions do I hope that my potential clients can ask how, how I know I can help them things that are like softballs for me. Uh, and then really what I ask them for at the beginning is acceptance criteria is you have an, you reached out to me because you have an idea of what you want. Tell me what that exactly is before we get to our conversation. And then as Jimmy mentioned, I spend the entire time talking about those questions that you've asked me to answer. Essentially, how should this work? Why should it work? What time frame does this need to work on? Uh, so on and so forth. It's a, uh, when you spend more time asking them questions, helping them uncover not only their own pain, but maybe they re recognize at some point through, uh, it's like, oh, well, I'm asking you these questions, but really, I need help with this. I'm asking you to help me with my IT infrastructure, but turns out that's okay. I'm really behind in cybersecurity, though. Uh, you get to the you get to the bottom of why people want, want to end up working with you much faster. Doesn't necessarily increase velocity. The, the best thing you can do to increase velocity of sales is just increase the number of people you're talking to that can potentially be a client at some point. It's just a numbers game at some level. Create deep relationships. We're actually about to go into somebody's question about that. Create deep relationships with the people in your community, the businesses that you'd want to work with. And then don't pretend that they're just prospects. Actually get to know them, understand them. 
Uh, that's the, the best way to end up selling uh, and increase the velocity of your own sales. These are complex sales and complex sales always take time. Like there, there's always going to be a velocity problem in this sales process. So to Connor's point, fill the top of the funnel, make sure you talk to a lot of people and that'll help you kind of avoid the burden of, of the slow sales cycle. Yep. Um, Aaron Monroe asks a really great question that ties into this Rocky. Uh, and they say, I've been in the MSP sales for four years now and I'm marginally successful. I have no technical background. So my approach was and still is laser focused on making friends, understanding why the business started and understanding what problems they are facing. I'm pretty good with CEOs and COOs. My goal is to have deeper conversations with CIOs and CTOs. So that is the first question. Uh, does any of y'all want to take? I just posted that in the uh, chat for everyone to see. So you don't forget about it. Um, that's exactly the point. What was that? I'd say, I'd say keep doing that. That's the right thing to do. It is um, I think with with having the technical discussions, you need to like like there's pattern recognition to it. So the question might be different in cybersecurity. Um, you know, do you work with um, FedRAMP, CMMC? Are you blah, 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 blah. Right. So it's different questions, but the pattern is compliance. And then you need a talk track for compliance and you need a person to dive deeper on it. Um, and there's the same thing with with lots of different things. So. You need to, uh, one, continue making friends and build a relationship. Uh, two, understand how to bucket uh, the different asks, whether it be your internal security, uh, the the um, uh, product or uh, procedures or security that you have with whatever you know type of cyber discussion you're having, um, and then uh, anything to do with compliance, anything to do with tech or features or widgets, speeds and feeds types of things. And you have so you know playbooks to sort of redirect that, um, but a, a feeling being uh, confident in your answers and doing enough that you um, like can answer honestly. And if you don't know something, say I'm not really sure, but I can get back to you on that specific answer. I know X Y Z, and I believe this is related, but I'm going to find that out for you. You're going to be fine. Like you don't need to have the answer to everything. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, like you're you're doing the right thing if you're focusing on building the relationships and discovering the problems. You're right back to know, like, and trust. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. You're getting to know them. You're building relationships and friendships. You're starting to understand their business so that they start to trust you because you seem genuinely interested in what they're working on. Um, don't get hung up on the CIO and the CTO. That's what sales engineers are for. That's what the nerdy guys behind you are for. Your superpower is that you don't walk in speaking like a nerd. If you come in and use all the all the crazy CIO, CTO language, the CEO and the CEO aren't going to connect with you. And they're never going to sit you down in front of the CIO or CTO and go, hey, talk to my guy, right? Because yeah. they're going to immediately disconnect from you and go, this guy's just like all the rest of those nerds. I can't talk to him. I don't understand what he's saying. The, the real struggle that smart people who have a ton of experience in cybersecurity and technology have is they want to come in and talk about all the buzzwords. We want to tell them how many how many gigabytes we got and how many petaflops and how many EDR, MDR, XDRs that they don't care about. I, I, I joke about this all the time and, and when I give my presentations and I'm like, you, know, you go to give a QBR and you want to show them how many how many backups you backed up and how many anti-spams you anti-spammed and how many antiviruses you antivirused and they don't care, right? They really just want to know their problem went away. They don't speak that language. They don't understand that language. You might as well be speaking French. So stick to your superpower figure out who the person in your organization is who can support you when you get outside of your comfort zone and spend your time building better relationships. Let somebody else come in and back clean up for you when you get in front of the, the, the chief nerd at the, at the organization that you're going to work with. I will tell you, uh, being able to communicate more effectively, having a little bit more empathy and being likable is far greater a superpower than being the smartest technical person in a room. Yep. Uh, people will run through doors head first uh, for you if you make them feel like you understand their pain and you can help them with it uh, not in a way that's salesy and pushy and you're just trying to increase the value of their own business but in a way that's actually helping them get from a to b you'll you'll see as we continue talking most most of sales is quite literally building relationships and being a transformative partner that's it it's not about selling something it's about transforming the person that's uh, paying you to do so well, then we have a long question here 
Uh, hi, from Cybersecurity Startup. Any magic tricks to convince customers to test something new from what I've heard so far from MSPs? I love how they put the S, the second S in the parentheses. Yes, that second S is a contentious topic. Uh, it's a big problem getting people to test new solutions. Everyone seems to want something that was already tested by somebody else, even if it was solves a problem they have. One MSP told me that they had a big problem, even with the solution from a big reputable vendor, only because it was something completely new. Do y'all care? I act, I run into this on a daily basis, being the founder of a startup. Do y'all care if I take this first bet? Okay. I'm with it. So this is what I found. Uh, you have to understand, I hope I'm pronouncing it Michael, right? I, don't, I see that there's non-English characters in there. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Michael, I'll tell you this. Um, that is a hard hurdle to get over. And the only way to get over it long-term is to own up to the fact that you are an immature startup. And you should tell that from two people right from the beginning. I literally used to say, we're a new company. We have very few employee employees, but I can tell you what I am. I'm laser focused on just you, on just the, the type of company you are. In that case, it was MSPs. I'm laser focused on helping you solve these problems. If I can't help you solve them today, will you at least do me the favor? Please help me understand how I can solve your problem better. And I'll come back to you three months, four months, five months, six months now. It's to, to own up to it. You have to own up to the fact that you're not IBM and nobody got fired buying IBM, but they might get fired. Like buying you is, is, is how they feel. Uh, so you have to own up to that is if you, if you don't have that brand recognition, if you don't have that stability and size to lean back on, the only thing you have at that point is transparency, honesty, uh, and effort. And you can show all three of those things from the very beginning. Nobody got fired for buying from IBM, but somebody got fired for still running a mainframe. And that's the difference, right? There's a point at which we have to go, hey, it's time for the new technology. But as a startup, it's hard, right? And Jimmy's been at startups and Connor's a startup and I've been through multiple startups. Like it's a it's a struggle. Um, this is where falling back to that relationship adds the value, right? The people who, who have a relationship with you will buy from you regardless, even though they know you may not be the the uh, the, the perfectly polished penny that they eventually want to work with. Yeah, and and we should, you know, probably get going to the rest of our scheduled programming. But I will add to it um, from a different lens, right? Same question from a different lens. Um, is is a new tech, right? So the past two companies that I've been at, Scout and CyberQP, we we're both sort of, you know, in that first first class to market category. So at Scout, it was us and and Perch um, were the only ones really offering SIM services specifically to MSPs back in 2018, 2019. I, and lots of other companies came and there's, you know, subcategories and stuff. But it was people were buying that category of software for the first time. And it was all education. Um, yes, there is a pure effect. So, you know, when one person buys it and uses it successfully, protects their customers, makes money off it, then other people start to do it. And then the same thing as CyberQP, you know, privileged access management, just in time accounts, like these are all new things to um, the MSP community. And um, I love doing it. I don't, I wouldn't ever work in a startup that um, isn't bringing new tech to market. I think, I don't know. It's just me. No, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, you're either a rendition of old tech or you're new tech, but you got to know to it. Um, and, you know, the joy is in solving big problems, right? That's why we're all here. That's why we dig, dig, dig our hands into technology in the first place. So why, why go play with yesterday's old problems? Absolutely. Um, question for you, Alex. Where do MSPs get started selling new and existing clients? And maybe we can break this up into two topics because yeah. I know the sales process is very different for new and existing. Yeah. Let, well, let's start with existing because that's the easy one, right? You already have existing customers. We want to sell to them. We want to sell more products and services to them. Um, if you're not having regular strategic conversations with your customers, they're not going to buy from you. You spend all this time and energy. We've heard all the sales guys in the chat saying, Hey, I got to put all this time into a long sales cycle before somebody knows, likes, and trusts me well enough to buy from me. Um, why would you put all that, all those touch points into a customer who the day you take their first trouble ticket, you're going to stop talking to them outside of the help desk. I don't know the answer to that. I've been asking that question for years and nobody can give me the answer, but it's the standard status quo experience at most MSPs. So we've got to shift to a world where we show our existing clients that they have value, that we help them understand the strategy, that we help show them the risk that they still have inside their organization because cybersecurity moves the needle every day. They, we are literally moving the goalpost. 
every single day. So we have to continue to talk to those customers. When we continue to talk to them in the same way that Jimmy and I and J- Jimmy and Connor and I were just talking about earlier, as a consultant, as a as someone who's just trying to help them understand their business, their pain, solve for those things, if we just go have those conversations, our customers will continue to buy from us. Our existing customers will buy more products and services. They'll do their renewals. They, they will buy our upsells. All of that just falls into place. I will say the the uh, the holy grail component that we used at Lifecycle Insights when we built that tool, and that was the the sole purpose of this tool. Um, the the one component that really moved the needle for folks was budgeting. Um, I'm a firm believer, and all of you think about your favorite customer, your your biggest customer, your most badass customer. Who in that organization? They're super mature. They're they're the guy who you look up to and respect, and you're grateful that they do business with you. Who in that organization is qualified to budget for all of their technology needs? My guess is every one of you is like, crap, nobody, right? You're the only one. You're the only person in the organization, and you're not even really in the organization, who knows all the hardware, all the software, all the, you know, the, the little IoT devices and things tucked in the corner. Um, you're the only one who knows the full picture or who could put together the full picture with a little bit of work. So if you build the budget and help them strategically understand where spend has to happen, you can break the cycle of the traditional MSP, which is, and I tell the joke, like, how does every MSP walk into a QBR? Knock, knock. Hey, guys, I need money. Um, <laughs> if we can break that cycle, right, and come in and say, hey, guess what? This quarter, I don't need money, but here's what's going to happen over the next 12 to 18 months. Here are the places where I am going to need money. And I can tell you right now that two years from now, I'm going to need $20,000. And I know that's a big number. So I'm telling you early so you have time to prepare. Right. But we got to break this cycle of knock, knock, I need money because our customers feel like we only come around. We're back to the little red sports car when I need to make my Tesla payment. Right. <laughs> so we've, we've got to change that cycle. And if we can do that, our customers will buy from us. And I say that because at Lifecycle, we worked with 1100 MSPs and they all came back to us and said, holy crap, this is magic. No, it's not. It's a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's not magic. We literally just built a platform with a spreadsheet in it and made it easy for you guys to present it like that. That what that is the magic. Um, so to expand on that, though, how do I get from existing customers to new customers? Well, I go wow the shit out of my existing customers. And then when we when we wrap up that meeting, I go, hey, I know it's the first time I've really presented a budget to you. And you probably been wanting to see that for a long time. But how was today? Today, Did I deliver some value to you today? Is this the kind of meeting you need to have for me moving forward? And if they say no, you need to be prepared to step back and say, I'm so sorry I missed the mark. What did you need to see that I didn't deliver today? But if they say yes, if they go, Jimmy, God damn it, I've been waiting for 15 years for you to show me that budget spreadsheet. Thank you so much. That now is when you get the, get the opportunity to ask. That's right? when you wake up from your dream, right? When they right. Say that. But it happens. Believe it. Trust me, it happens. And uh, I had one customer who told me that he his company had a brand new CEO that came out of enterprise and they're working for this nonprofit. They dragged him out in the hallway after the meeting and said, I never thought I'd be able to get this kind of business data at a small little nonprofit. And I'm just so grateful for it. The guy was petrified. He's like the brand new CEO, the ba- brand new badass CFO is hauling me out in the hallway. And, um, but it happens. But what you have to do is you have to deliver the right relationship to your customer and then use that to expand and say, hey, Jimmy, I notice, you know, you work with your know, your, your, your friends on LinkedIn with so-and-so over at this business. They'd be a perfect customer for me. They're right in my sweet spot. Anyway, you'd be willing to make an introduction for me and maybe say something good about the conversation we had today. It would mean a lot to me. Um, if you're not comfortable asking like that, then just hey, you know, who else do you know who would see value in what we did today? Right. But I encourage you go go through their LinkedIn and pick a couple people and say, hey, these people are on my list. These are folks I'd want to talk to. So Adam had a question that we might have skipped past, which was uh, what are the best ways for an MSB to do outbound prospecting? Adam, Alex just answered that. Wow the shit out of your existing clients. And then when you've done that and you've confirmed you've done that, ask them for friends that they work with that also have businesses or people that they know that are unhappy. You know, business owners usually have friends that are other business owners. And if you make one of them happy, they're going to recommend you. Um, so that's that's the best place to start. I always used to say to sum up what Alex said in a, in a tweet that I actually made like a couple months ago, make time to talk to your customers or they'll make time to talk to your competitors. Not talking to customers is a, is a symptom of horrible priorities, not a symptom of being busy. We used to we used to say at Lifecycle, if you're not talking to your customer, somebody else is. Yep. And then uh, economic downturns or place at times when it's more expensive to um, find new customers. Uh, your existing customers is the cheapest source of new revenue. 
Yeah. You've already paid that high customer acquisition cost. Anybody here? Is anybody here? Like anybody want to throw something in the chat if you're getting a bunch of referrals from your existing customers? Yeah. While we wait for that. Right. Well, wait for that to come in. Aaron Monroe asks, uh, essentially, what are the best ways to get technology and soft skills? What can you do to develop both? I will tell you from experience watching, not myself, but others go through um, Toastmasters. If you don't know how to present, if you don't know how to talk, if you get nervous, go to a Toastmasters club. It's There's probably five or six of them that are near your, your organization uh, or where you live, and you could just join one and learn how to talk. Big yeah. Delaware. Yep. You said big in Delaware. All six people in Delaware joined up. They're they're all they're all Josh. There. Josh used to run one. That's funny. Um, I'm going to throw one more thing in the chat too. Um, th- there is a little organization called MSP Dojo, which is a gentleman who Robert Gillette runs a um, a uh, little group that literally just practices sales stuff. They they literally just practice the the little com- combative um you know objection handling and those kind of things and sales and they do a really really good job um it, it's a great place if you're a little uncomfortable and you want to go get a little more uncomfortable along the way while you improve your skills he's doing a great job with things over there i have no relationship with him other than just i see what he's doing and i think it's really cool um but to wrap the thought on on referrals if you're not getting referrals from your current customers i'm going to challenge each of you to do something for the next week that may fix that for you Take your customers and split them sp- split them into even lists of five, five days worth or five days worth of customers. Break your customers out into five lists. Monday, grab the phone, call the first list. Jimmy, you know what? I'm embarrassed to say this. We've been working together for a long time, and I never ask you, what does a good referral look like to you? I meet new people in my business all the time. I really like you. I respect you. And if I met somebody who was a good referral to you, I would want to send that person to meet with you. Do you mind spending a few minutes and just tell me what a good referral looks like? What have I done? I put my best foot forward and said, I'm going to send you a referral. How dare you come across somebody who is a good fit for me that you're not willing to send back to me. You could call uh, most of the MSPs in the room could call every customer they have in five days and and be done what 30, 40 minutes a day. Wouldn't take you long. Right. And somebody before you get off that phone is going to go, you know, actually I was talking to somebody yesterday. You should talk to My dad always said, uh, my dad works in real estate. He always said the best real estate agents are the best prospectors, not the best closers. It's the people Mm -hmm. who get up every day and talking to your existing clients is absolutely prospecting. Yeah. So my God, I just bought a house. I can't imagine a real estate agent who's a closer. Like, (laughs) come on in here and buy this one, right? You know, their job is to show it to you and let the property close itself. It's just like you showing your customer solution and letting the solution close itself. Absolutely. Right. To close the other thought, um, the guy who was asking about where to get technical knowledge, check out Empath. <laughs> check out Empath. Uh, what is the actual website? Is it empath.com? Empath, em- empathmsp.com. Empathmsp.com. There's new content mm-hmm. coming out all the time. So that Alex doesn't have to shamelessly plug his uh, his own company. Uh, I do know Wes. I do know Alex very, very well. Uh, and I have talked to a ton of their partners already because – some of them are my partners uh, at my own company, and their whole their whole point is to educate you in such a way that you can have a a, the, a proper conversation with somebody, uh, not feel salesy, not get too technical. Originally, I thought the whole thing was to bring the empathy bring empathy back to the conversation. Uh, I don't know if that's still like it the was, whole line y'all are going, but yeah, it was just a cool word. Empath is a cool word. I'm an empath. I can feel your feelings right now. <laughs> So this last topic, sales process. Um, I would love for people, uh, Jimmy, in your case, I'd love for people to be able to walk away from this conversation and have a few steps that they can, I don't want to say implement, but begin thinking about for their sales process. They can put things into buckets. They can understand a little better. What would you suggest? How should people start understanding their own sales process? Yeah, I mean... So sales process is a technical term in in addition to a functional term, I guess. Um, So what I mean is there's two contexts. One is like the whole anatomy of a sale, which includes getting a lead, prospecting it, you know, having initial meetings, converting into an opportunity, closing the opportunity, all of that. When I'm talking about sales process in this context right now, what I'm talking about is your face-to-face sales meeting and the anatomy of that conversation. So really like having that 
that conversation. Um, it should always start with, um, you know, getting to know them and discovery. And the majority of the conversation should be on their business, what their goals are, where they want to be, any regulations they need to meet to, any critical data or critical information they need to protect, um, what they do, who their customers are, why they started the business, all of that stuff. And there's like a long list of questions you go through and you can go up and down, up and down. And you can even joke with people along the way, be like, when they say there's a lot of questions or like, I just want to hear about the product or something. You say like, look, 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 I just want to really understand to make sure I'm contextualizing things properly or offering you the best solution. The next step is to qualify yourself uh, a little bit as a, um, you know, that you know a little bit about cybersecurity. And um, that could be like recognizing um, whatever they said, you know, I know your critical data is blah, 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 blah. Here's some current threats that we see out in the landscape. Here's what we do a little bit briefly. Um, the, the next thing is to uh, talk about the problem a little bit and really outline it from them. From our conversation, I noticed that you have this information. You have 10 servers, you have 100 employees, you have blah, 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 blah. You need to protect them. The way cybersecurity works is we build layers of security around um, your critical data. You know, you take them through that conversation and then um, that's how you sort of explain how, you know, you can initially talk about the products and solutions that you have to build the layers of security around it. And then um, you really need to get them at some point to agree that they actually have a cybersecurity problem. Like if they're not convinced on that, then you need to go back to discovery and restart the entire conversation. Cause if they're just like, yeah, 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 yeah I don't really care about that. Um, then it's pointless. You can talk pricing, you can talk products, you can talk whatever you want, but they're not going to buy it because they don't need it. Um, and then once you have that final buy-in, then you can start having the uh, pricing conversation um, and sort of, begin your closing process that's how it works perfectly in a vacuum <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're like physics, I love a vacuum yeah. pretend there's no uh air resistance friction does not exist and everything is a point all right go I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that. And I think, uh, you know, everybody's got their own process. You can read, uh, there's there's uh, that whole bookcase down there is all sales books, right? You can read all of those and everybody will tell you a different way to do it. Um, Keith asked a great question in the Q&A. Um, do you use a stock sales process or do you go with the flow based on the rapport or the relationship with the prospect? Um, I'm, I want to answer that and kind of take an it depends. The more experience you get, the more you can just go with the flow. If you're bringing in and trying to upskill and train really rookie salespeople, feed them a process. Give them something like what Jimmy was just talking about. And most importantly, write it down, right? Make sure that they, that they can see on paper. I start here. I can't go from here to here without achieving something, getting a piece of information, collecting something. I can't get from this step to this step until I get a commitment from the client that they'll meet with me again next week. You know, Whatever that process is, write it down. And then when you're done with the step in the sales process, doesn't matter if it's the first step, the second step, the third step, every time, go back and look at your process, figure out whether or not you were successful. And if you were successful, remind yourself what you did, right? Hey, I said this to the customer and that seemed to really resonate. This seemed to work. I said this to the customer and they sat back away from the table and went, oh, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that, right? And if you get good at this, that, that little redux of, of your sales calls will help help you refine your version of your company's sales process. But your company should have a sales process. Your organization should say, this is how we sell to a customer. This is what the, you know, what, what the FIN experience should feel like or what the your MSP experience should feel like. We go in and we have three calls with our customer. We have five in five meetings. We do whatever that whatever that number is. And the better you get at it, the, the easier it'll be, the less you'll have to rely on the process, the more you'll be able to kind of flow in and out of the process, but you'll still have some key things you need to collect along the way, right? I need to know a budget. I need to know who the decision makers are and who's going to get in my way. I need to know, um, you know, what pain exists in the, in the organization. I need to know what risk they have, what sensitive data that we're trying to protect. Um, those are the four that I focus on, right? Pain, budget, decision-making process, and what risk exists in the organization. If I collect all four of those, and I know that, that I that my solution solves the pain that they have within the budget that they have and addresses their risk. Hey, I can probably move forward to a close. And I know which five people to invite in the room because I know who's involved. 
Um, so, you know, you'll build out your own process and you'll find 200 people in the channel who will, will tell you how to do this. I think the important thing is that you have your process and that you realize that until you really nail it, until you're at 40, 50, 60% close rates, it, it's a fluid thing. You're going to go back and jot notes down on it and you're going to tweak it and change it and say, hey, don't ever say that again. Try this new thing. Um, and, and it'll continue to be a little fluid until you really nail it. But you can't go in the room and be Jimmy. You can't go in the room and be me. Um, I sent an account manager who I was kind of training to go out and do, do some outside sales um, out to see Alex Rogers at Chartech. And he came back and the day he came back, he sat down in the chair across from me and he said, if you want me to do that, I quit. And I went, what do you mean? He's like, that dude is like Kramer from, from Seinfeld on steroids. The guy's just like all over the place. And he's like, he could sell ice to Eskimos. I'm not that guy. And I went, crap, I didn't teach you there. I didn't send you there to become Alex Rogers. I sent you there to learn a few tips and a few tricks to refine what you do. And I think that's the biggest thing you can take away is that you can learn something from every salesperson in the channel, even if it's, oh, that sounds gross. I don't want to say it that way, but you can learn something from every single one of us. Yeah. The, um, there's my for, rant. There's your rant. You're off the soapbox now. Yeah. Um, for, uh, uh, one thing I've always thought about when it comes to sales is what matters most is authenticity is you'll never know, like, and trust someone that you never believe is authentic. And so as Alex is saying, your goal should never to be somebody else or to do somebody else's sales process. You can go take inspiration and you can go, you know, cobble together certain pieces of it, like Jimmy was saying, but what you can't do is uh, take somebody else's process, take the way somebody else talks, take the questions that they ask and immediately assume that it's going to feel authentic coming from you. You have to figure out what's important to you. Um, what I would, to, to talk on Keith's question, what I would always do is the thing that was stock about the, the process was the questions that I would start the conversation with. What was never a stock sales process was whatever the customer answers is wherever we go past that point. I know that I need certain pieces of information and I'll direct the conversation back to those points, but however the client wanted to get there, however the prospect feel that they needed to say to get to those pieces of information, uh, is important, uh, and, and is what I would do. I would also bring the customer into that process to begin with before I'd meet on a call. Hey, we're going to have three meetings. I want to get this out of meeting one, this out of meeting two, this out of meeting three. Do you have any issue with that? Is there any problem here? Is there anything you think I'm missing? I'd ask them for, honestly, at the beginning is because I had no idea how to talk and how to do sales and how to get anyone to buy anything. So I was really hoping that somebody who had bought things from other companies would help me with that. And then unintentionally, I stumbled on, oh, people love to tell you, um, about how how they'd like to buy from you. You just have to ask them the right questions. No, it's like buying a car. Like imagine if you could go in the in the auto dealer and go, I don't want to do this thing where you go back and forth for four hours. I don't want to talk to your manager. I don't want you to have to go to talk to your manager. What do we have to do to get this done in 15 minutes? And them going, oh, we can do that. It's really hard to do. But if you could, wouldn't buying a car suck less? Like our goal should be remove the friction in the process. I just oh, pressed yeah. bought a car online this week. I just pressed a couple buttons. That's got to be amazing. I used to sell cars when I was younger, when I was like 20. And that was the worst job I've ever had. Um, and I can tell you horror stories about that over a beer one night. So if anybody here wants, sees me at a conference, <laughs> you want to hear some horror stories about buying cars. Happy to tell you those. I uh, I went to CarMax. I walked in. First person rep that helped me. I First question I asked him. Do you make any more or less money based upon the car that I buy? They said, nope, it's a fixed, uh, it's a fixed price. It's awesome. I want four wheels. I want this, this range, and I want it to be roughly this amount. I don't care what you put in front of me. It's like, do our incentives align perfectly? You're not making more or less money because you're suggesting things that I've asked for. So it's funny. I love working with salespeople and getting sold to. And I like love it when they're commissioned and really get sold well and negotiating too. But the I bought a car from CarMax years ago, and then I lived in New York City and car for a long time, and then bought a car online the other day that there's just the price is the price. So I never got to have that experience. Pretty sad about yeah, it. Yeah, you're not missing anything. It's not fun. I, I bought my last car from a dealership in Ohio and had them ship it to me. So I never even saw it before I bought it. But, um, you know, I think... The point is we're all talking about different frictions that exist in sales processes. And uh, that that's something you should think about as we're kind of wrapping up. Like think, think about the ways you can remove friction from the sales process for your pr prospect. That's going to be an improvement in their mind. Yeah. 
Uh, well, with that, it's 2.59 at least Eastern time, so we should definitely wrap up. Uh, Alex, Jimmy, thanks so much for being here, for for telling people uh, what you think and how and helping educate them. Uh, sales is really hard, so uh, I'd imagine everyone's looking for all the help they can get. I will tell everyone listening, at some point, you just need to go out and try it and do it and learn and fail and fall on your face and figure it out. Uh, reading will only get you so far. Listening to us, even though we've figured it out in some capacity, uh, will only get you so far. You got to get out and do that. Um, I would like to remind you, we have two more webinars in our Deep Cyber Dive series. We have Reed Wellick, the president from Fifth Wall, on next week to talk about cyber insurance. If you're dealing at with any cyber insurance, it can be a black hole of information and uncertainty. Uh, make sure you and yourself and your clients are educated. I highly recommend you come on with that. And then we actually have, uh, how is cybersecurity different from managed IT? MSPs went through the transition of break fix to managed services, and now you're going from managed services to also having to provide cybersecurity in some cases. Uh, so definitely uh, come join me, come join Wes Spencer and Kyle Christensen as we talk about what is the difference between cybersecurity and managed IT and how you can begin positioning that to yourself and your clients. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. You all have been great. The questions were amazing. Alex, uh, Jimmy, any any closing remarks, any last thing you'd like to say? Sales is hard. Yeah, it is. It's hard. It takes practice. Um, we are building, uh, actually, we've already built a five-part building your sales process course in Empath. So if you guys want to come check it out, empathmsp.com. Find me on LinkedIn if you want a free trial. Like, let's not let price be, an, be a, 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 a barrier for anybody. Let's be frictionless to work with, right? Awesome. I think there's at least one guy in the chat who, who's going to take you up on that. I'd be upset if nobody felt like they could. What if it's actually Jimmy? He just, <laughs> yeah. he DMs you on LinkedIn. I'll give Jimmy a license for free. <laughs> I just want to say we have legends like that in our product. So, you know, come hang out. You, I'm going to charge extra. Ah, damn. Got it. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Well, uh, everyone, thanks for joining. This was amazing. Jamie, you're behind the scenes, but thank you so much for putting this together. Everyone, if you're at your house, give a Jamie, quick round of applause Jamie, for Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. Thanks for and hurting the cats, Jamie. And we will see all of y'all on the next episode. Uh, you'll get a link with the recording. So we'll see y'all soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.